best time to write is now. The best place to write is here. The best person to write is you. you. Thank you very much. Um, just so everyone knows, we have books over there ranging between six and fifteen and twenty dollars. We also have shirts here that since you're here, they are seven dollars. They're usually twelve plus shipping. So please be generous. Can I? I forgot. Can I just say real quick? Sure. Um, so if anyone's interested in my book, I'm on Instagram as Molly Fuller Yap. Y E A H, and I'll announce my book on there. Okay. <laughs> so it's just Molly Fuller Yap. Molly Fuller Yap. Yeah. 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 For our next feature, um, okay, so are any of you familiar with the poetic style Cento? C E N T O? I'm sure Robert and Molly, I don't know if you know, I don't know if you, how much you know about poetry. I know you're a short fiction but not a fiction Anyway, if you take lines from pieces that already exist and you put them into a poem, um, so I wrote a series that went into Poemaholic, which are, they have copies here, if you want to get one. Um, they were all lyrics from Nirvana songs, and I went by each different album. Uh, this one is, this one is uh, Unplugged. This is from, from the Unplugged album. Um, creatively titled Broken Nirvana. It starts with a quote. Punk is musical freedom. It's saying, doing, and playing what you want. Kurt Cobain. Hang me out to dry to fit this easy shoe. I want to be, to come as a sunbeam, doesn't want an angry man who sold me. Distill the life inside a liar, a thief, steal the sun and fall asleep. The soul is cheap, Polly's crackers, back hurts. Get off her and on a plane. Can't complain, my brothers died. Something in the way I lived underneath the bridge, scanning for the next plateau. Greenland, Mexico. I can't see the whole expanse and end of me where bad folks go when they die. Don't go to heaven with all apologies. Everything is my fault, and I shivered where I slept last night. Thank you. Our next performer has been coming to Right Night Show since we started doing the Take the Night Off, Second Fridays. Brandy. Us. <laughs> um, I, I think she only missed one, maybe. Uh, since, since April, I think. Yeah, so like, I think you didn't come to the May one. Yeah. But yeah, every, 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 every other one, Daria has been with us. So please welcome, with much enthusiasm, Daria Quinn. <laughs> for my so-called band. Um, so if after the show you want to check some of that out, I uh, have flyers. Um, most of that material doesn't translate well to spoken word, but there will be a uh, one at that end at least. Hopefully y'all will be in for a little um, audience participation with that one. So we are going to go ahead and begin. Hello, my name is Daria Quinn, and I am a god. Not the god, mind you. That's a bit more complicated. Basically, the god is not so much a being as he is a concept. The idea that all there is, was, or ever could be is connected by a single shared or origin. And to our knowledge of science and the, and the cosmos, it's true. We all come from hydrogen and carbon and share a common lineage with stars and snails. However, despite all of that, we are unique because we know ourselves. We have a greater understanding of ourselves and the cosmos than any other creature we have ever observed. We've built homes, invented machines, discovered fire and electricity and magnetism and bent them to our will. We have powered our engines through sunlight and water and wind and the fossilized remains of the dead centuries past. We have forged civilizations, founded nations, built churches and synagogues in tribute to powers beyond our comprehension, 
yet still manage to hold on to the curiosity of a child and seek out the answers to questions we have only just learned to ask. Our creativity makes us gods, whether it's expressed through art, machinery, science, philosophy, literature, athletics, mathematics. We have always looked at what is and asked ourselves what could be, what can be, what can we do different? What can we do better? Can this change? And will that change be for the better? And if not, why not? And let's see if we can change that too. We refuse by virtue of our very existence to be shackled to our limitations as we reach towards greatness. We are the culmination of billions upon billions of centuries of nuclear reactions, mutations, adaptations, diversifications, and conceptions. And it is through us that the next great thing in this universe will come to pass, if not by our hands, by the hands of our children's children, children. If you are alive and you have a soul, a thought in your mind, and the will to carry it out, you too are a god. of myself as a poet. I don't really do poetry. I just sew together words. I just sew together words into tapestries of things that I'm trying to say. And sometimes they might sound like poetry, but it's not, not what I'd call it. I actually think that my work is too dense to be considered poetry. I don't paint a pretty picture with words. I build civilizations out of them. I'm founding nations and creating history with words, and the words you're hearing now are only but a fraction of the ones that were written in the conception of this particular piece. My world, my work, is a realm unto itself, and I am the god of that realm, molding it into something larger than both of us, because my words don't matter unless someone's there to witness them, and you are here as witnesses. If you believe that I'm a poet, then I'm a poet. My words empower and inspire you, do what you will with them. Once these words leave me, they become yours. And if you choose to keep them, if you choose to share my work, it'll live forever. If you leave it behind, it was always meant to die. This I do at your mercy, but I don't do these things for you. I do these things because that is what a writer does. If I didn't write, I wouldn't be me. Because that's how art works. It's not made because you want to make it. You, you make it because you're cursed to make it. You have been damned by the gods of creativity to constantly toil at your craft until something of worth comes out. And you keep on doing that until all the things that drive you to create have finally been mined out of you. And then, and only then, will you ever find peace. Transgender people, we're not a new thing. We've existed long before you, long before America, even long before the gender binary. We have been here long before Caitlyn Jenner, Jazz Jennings, Laverne Cox, and the Wachowski sisters. Perhaps you're familiar with Martha P. Johnson. Actually, no, probably not. Martha Johnson is often forgotten, a critical piece of LGBT history, sadly ignored even within our own community. Martha Johnson, was the one that threw the first rock that started the riots at Stonewall. She initiated gay pride. Before parades, she fought the raids. Her act of defiance is the first shot fired in the battle for gay and transgender liberation. She started all of this, and you've likely never heard of her. Not only because she was queer, but because she was black. In America, we have a tendency to overlook that. Black History Month comes, and there's never a mention. Pride Month comes and only the transgender pay her attention. How our Pride Month began, the rallies and parades, all started with a woman who was sick and tired of police raids. She lived in a time where simply wearing a dress was illegal. This was 50 years ago, barely a generation removed. Cops would raid the stone wall and arrest all the cross-dressers. Martha Johnson said, fuck that, and attacked her oppressors. 
She threw the first stone. Yeah, I said it. Threw the first stone. Taken directly from the Bible because Martha Johnson never sinned. Her dress was a bullshit crime. Her rights were constantly infringed. All because she wanted to go dancing on a Saturday night in Greenwich Village. Imagine for a second that your entire existence was deemed a crime. That every time you just wanted to go out with friends, you'd do time. That the clothes you'd wear were considered obscene, and a life free of police harassment was considered just a dream. Think of, of that for a moment before you consider the pronouns you use to define my gender. Think of the violence that trans women encounter, both physical and mental, compounded forever into a single act that you can control. Whether you understand it or not, it's a matter of respect. I introduced myself to you as female, who happens to be transgender. The female is a noun, transgender is a modifier. My pronouns don't change simply because I'm transgender. I was introduced to you as a woman, and I expect to be regarded as such. No, and no amount of age or ignorance allows you to rip off the baseline human respect that I am owed and deserve. I am a woman, now take me at my word. Anything else is completely absurd. I have a mental illness. Several, actually. I am bipolar. That basically means that I have severe mood swings, which can be caused by, well, anything, really. I have periods where I can be extremely active, even overactive, followed by periods of depression where my activity level completely bottoms out. I'm on medication that helps slow this process down and balance it out, but it doesn't actually go away, and it's probably never going to. I have major depression, which is basically a severe form of depression, uh, where I have difficulty self-motivating, it also causes a decrease in energy, and makes it difficult to enjoy well, anything. It's kind of like having this big giant weight you're always having to drag around everywhere. It makes everything harder and less enjoyable to do, and it's constantly exhausting you to carry this thing around. I'm on medication for this as well, and it does stuff. <laughs> Some days I feel a lot better, I have more energy, I feel more productive, others, not so much. But it's still a massive, over, uh, a massive improvement over where I was before medication. I am obsessive compulsive. I have a hard time walking away from a puzzle, or a situation that doesn't offer a me measure of closure. I have a tendency to hyperfixate on a single detail of a given situation, and I absolutely must have a solution or some other form of closure on the matter before I can move on to anything else. I can also hyperfixate on a hobby or a special interest for hours, sometimes days at a time. These hyperfixations will see me ignore basic daily routines, such as eating, sleeping, showering, and other basic forms of self-care. I will neglect social contacts. I will outright ignore people. And this kind of stuff happens to me all the time. Sometimes I'll just get this idea in my head and I'll jump on Wikipedia and 12 hours later, I'm still reading articles. This was my entire day. And now some of you, some, now there are some days that, sorry, there are some days that I don't even get off of Facebook. And no matter how normal you think that is, it's not, because you don't go 16 hours doing nothing but checking your timeline, reading the same 20 posts over and over, waiting for someone to respond to the 30 or so status updates you just posted over the last hour alone, only remembering to take your medication because somebody called you, because you need someone to call you to make sure you take your meds, and eat, and sleep. In fact, this part of the poem right here, this is me hyperfixating on me hyperfixating. It's like inception. <laughs> it's, and it's not healthy. They don't make a medication for this, unfortunately. To be honest, you're never really going to get rid of it. You have to train yourself to find ways to work around it. And you do that by setting alarms for yourself. So, you're, so you remember to eat and take your meds. You give yourself a set bedtime and then set an alarm for that as well so you don't forget. You get your friends involved and have them call you at certain times every day just to check in on you and keep you social. 
or you're like me and you're in a living situation where someone is checking in on you, making sure you eat, take your meds, that you're taking care of yourself. You don't ever really cure yourself of something like this. You only learn to work at it and not let it completely take over your life. I am also agoraphobic. That basically means that I am not okay in most situations. Outside of a specific, outside of a few specifically designated quote safe spaces. And I'm not talking about the Tumblr snowflake safe spaces. I'm talking about my bedroom, the social club at Coleman Behavioral Health, the LGBTS global group at Stark State, and in the company of very specific people. And that's it. Otherwise, I'm generally in a state of tense hypervigilance, a state which I may appear to be paranoid and severely anxious. If I don't look uncomfortable when you see me, it's because I am. And that discomfort level is significantly high. What you're seeing right now is the result of decades of me forcing myself out of my comfort zone in order to have something resembling an actual human life. And even this is something of a small miracle because it really doesn't take much for me to have a panic attack. And panic attacks for me are very painful. I don't really do the flailing about and hyperventilating bit that you typically associate with panic attacks. I've had those panic attacks, but they're not particularly common. Most of the time, my panic attacks take the form of intense centralized pain, usually right around the diaphragm. I tend to have, the, I tend to have a hard time breathing, and I literally feel as if my body is trying to implode on itself. This can last for several minutes, sometimes hours. I used to work a job as a cashier full time, and I would have at least one of these types of panic attacks during a shift every day. Many days, they'd last two, almost three hours at a time. That is on days where I wasn't having multiple attacks one after the other. And I kept working because I didn't know at the time that what I was feeling wasn't normal. None of this is normal. The only reason I'm doing this right now, this whole talking in front of strange people thing, the kind of thing you'd imagine wouldn't settle well with my agoraphobia, is because most people don't understand just how common mental illness is, nor do they recognize the symptoms of mental illness when they see them. Most people normalize their quirks, their feelings, their insecurities. They don't really talk about them because they think it's normal. But that's the problem. It's not normal. Because, there, because nobody knows it's not normal, because nobody wants to talk about it. And for the longest time, I didn't even want to talk about it. I didn't talk about my condition. I didn't talk to my counselor about it. I didn't talk to my doctor about it. I didn't talk to my caseworkers about it. I didn't talk to the staff of the psych wards about it. I didn't talk to my friends or family about it. I sure as hell didn't talk to strangers about it. I didn't talk to anybody about it. I've never talked to anyone about the full extent of my condition. And because I haven't talked about it, I'm almost 100% sure I'm not properly diagnosed. There's something else going on here, and I don't know what it is because I haven't been talking about it. I'm not getting the treatment I need because I'm not talking about the problems I have and normalizing them. And the worst thing you could ever do to yourself is normalize your pain. If any of this sounds familiar, don't ignore it. It's not normal. Time. Our cameras don't start work today. Yes. <laughs> ah, ten more minutes. If you got it. Cool. Well. All right. I guess we're going to go to our audience participation portion of the evening. As soon as I remember where I put it. All right. This is going to be fairly simple on y'all's part. I really just need y'all to keep a steady beat. So, everybody ready? Okay. Dance little robots, don't say a word. Never mind the map behind the curtain. He's only there to supervise the venue. Cash is a motivator, I am the innovator. Dance is a lifestyle, of rather choose. It's better than being daily abused by the stereotypical. 
better physical threat of a robot future when you mix with repeat. Please repeat. Lies on the beat, on the sound of the masses revolting against their program. When the men and the money are all dead and gone, and the art left behind is all of the proof that future programmers, dance beat remixers will ever have of this place called America. Rotting and bored with their so called existence, they rose up and decided that they would mix, rape, repeat, mix. Wave and peak. Always to the peak. Mix, wave and peak. Always to the peak. So who are you now? Some wanna be Kanye with a Daft Punk song as your backing track. A false new messiah to be crucified by these pop culture vultures who cry for a new way to rave. All that you need is the seed of the beat that's inside of you, growing and waiting for the sun. One day you will break out to the world. Your voice will be heard to this rave repeat. And then you're not going to come to the screen the way I recorded it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, how's everybody feel about Nazis? <laughs> All right, well, good. This is for everybody else in America, then. Okay, America, we need to sit down and talk because this whole Nazi thing, it's not okay. It's really not okay. And I see you rolling your eyes at me out there, America, thinking I'm some kind of lunatic up here. I'm losing my mind over what seems to be nothing more than a bunch of idiots waving around ugly flags, protesting in front of a statue, except that it's not. It's really not that simple. This, this whole Nazi thing, it's not okay. It's not okay that we have Nazis, actual real life Nazis, marching in the streets. This is not okay. None of this is okay. I don't know where you got the idea that this was okay, but it's not. It's not okay. We are not okay. And I get this, I get, <laughs> and I get it. This really isn't anything new. We've always had white supremacists out there. White power is a thing. I understand it's a thing. But America, this is really getting out of hand. Okay, we really need to do something about these people because they're starting to become like a real problem here. A problem we're actually going to have to deal with because these people are not going away. Hell, ever since Barack Obama became president, it's been like one big Nazi loving in this country. And this is not okay. We have Nazis working for the president. We have Nazis working for cable news. You got Nazis on the radio. We have Nazis making movies. You got Nazis on YouTube and Twitter. There's Nazis on Netflix. There's Nazis on Hulu. You got Nazis in your backyard, up the street, down the block. Your neighbors are Nazis. Your friends are Nazis. Oh, Marvel Comics even made Captain America a Nazi. Nazis are everywhere you look now, and this is not okay, America. Nazis have become so prevalent in this country nowadays. There's no more ignoring them. There's no more escaping them. They are all around us. They're here watching us as we go along our daily lives, pretending to be our allies, our friends, and our family. They've infiltrated our government. They've infiltrated our entertainment. They've infiltrated our families. Nazis are a daily part of our lives now, and this is not okay. America is not an innocent country by any means. We've slaughtered and stole lands from indigenous people. We rounded up and concentrated Japanese folk the moment we thought they might be a threat. And we've been threatening to do the same to Muslims ever since 9-11. We want to build a wall to assure that Latinos will always know their place. And we erect statues of slave owners and militarized police to show that black people will always know their place as well. We traded slaves for over 400 years. We literally owned people. We bought and sold people. And absolutely none of that is okay. We here in America, we're all racists. We're all misogynists, homophobes, transphobes, biphobes, anti-Semites, and Islamophobes. And we're damn proud of it. If there's something to hate, by God, we hate it. And we do so as a patriotic duty for God and country because we were raised to be Nazis. 
And that is not okay. The difference between us, between America and Adolf Hitler, is the distance the size of a sheet of paper. And there is a good chance that we've always been this way. From the very beginning, America have, may have always been a secret empire of Nazi fascists just waiting for an opportunity to assert our power over everyone else. And this is not okay. A lot of you listening are only just starting to realize what some folks have always known, whether they were native, black, Latino, Asian, Muslim, Jewish, female, gay, bisexual, or transgender. We've always known the bottom of the crushing foot of the secret American Nazi. Some of you are only starting to become angry now that the Nazis have stopped hiding, while others here are angry because we're starting to see you for the Nazis you've always been. <laughs> Some of you voted to make America great again, not knowing that this was a Nazi war cry. Because, of, because all of us, white and not, were raised with the lie that America was great to begin with, that America wasn't built on genocide and slavery, but instead the wisdom of old rich white men who longed for a freedom <laughs> from taxes. And that's not okay. That, that was not okay. <laughs> Two more minutes? Okay. You got it? Yeah, we can. All right. Well, so here I am, an angry transgender lesbian, about to scare off the conservative snowflakes and the fake allies who are only here for their cookies. Because how dare I share an angry thought, rant and rave about cis hetero ignorance, or have an opinion on about the people who oppress me. And just so you know, straight people, yes, you do, in fact, oppress me. So let me take this moment as you sit there in your seats to speak up for myself and for the others in my community who share these sentiments. The LGBTQ folk who are sick and tired of your complacent cis hetero bullshit sitting quietly by observing our systematic oppression and doing absolutely nothing about it. This isn't about marriage, this isn't about bathrooms, this isn't about your religious liberties or our basic human rights. This is about fear your fear of us. And let me assure you, your fears are well-founded. We are, in fact, coming for you. That's right, the fags, the dykes, the queers, and the trannies, we're all coming for you, street people. Oh yeah, we're coming for you. We're coming for your rights, we're coming for your privileges, we're coming for your ability to feel safe as yourselves, free from harm and harassment, regardless of your gender or sexual identity. We're coming for your prejudice, we're coming for your hate, we're coming for your ignorance. We're coming for your appropriation of our culture. Your queer eyes for the straight guys, your gay best friends, your, the term metrosexual, and your repurposing of drag culture as a spectator sport featuring me, Paul. We're coming for your fetishes, we're coming for your kinks, we're coming for your unicorns, and we're definitely coming for your so-called lesbian porn. <laughs> we're coming for your objectification and exploitation of trans women. We're coming for your terms trap, he, she, tranny, and she male. We're coming for your narratives that all trans women are sex workers, or that transgender people are inherently deceptive because we don't immediately out ourselves to everyone. And we're coming for your ability to label our genders as mental illnesses, as well as your ability to write off our genders because of our mental illnesses. We're coming for your gatekeeping. We're coming for your stereotypes. We're coming for your assumptions about our private sex lives. We're coming for your rude questions about our transitions and your ceaseless need to know about whether or not we've had the surgery. We're coming for your gay bashing. We're coming for your bullying. We're coming for your pray away the gay sermons and the, your barbaric religious torture camps you call conversion therapy services. We're coming for all the parents who disown their kids because God hates fags and I didn't raise no queers. <clears throat> We're coming for your Prop 8s and your HB2s. We're coming for your attempt to make our basic human rights a state issue. We're coming for the hypocritical senators who vote for these bathroom bills, then get caught soliciting sex in bathrooms themselves. And we're coming for the raging evangelists who pay for sex with gay hookers, then cry about their sins on television, begging for forgiveness after they get caught. We're coming for the culture that forces us into the closet. We're coming for your rape jokes, the gay jokes, the I can make her straight jokes. We're coming for the people who ask, why isn't there a straight pride parade? Or, which one of you is the man in a relationship? 
We're coming for your claims that it's just my opinion. As if your opinion had any bearing on my basic human rights. My sexuality is not subject to your opinion. My gender is not subject to your opinion. And you know damn well that my basic human rights are not subject to your opinion. You may not be aware of this, but I'm not living an alternative lifestyle. I'm just living a life like you, but without the rights or privileges that you enjoy. I don't get to just be myself without consequence. What I do is considered brave in your world because of people like you, the bigoted, sexist, racist, classic, homophobic, transphobic, religious, cisgender, heterosexual dick shit who by their <laughs> very existence marginalizes mine. We're not welcome in your cis hetero suburban utopias without a disguise. We're not welcome into your Christian homes or houses of worship unless we lie. Some of us can't even walk out on the street without the fear of physical violence simply because we don't look enough like a woman for the general public's liking. We can't use the bathroom without someone looking up our dresses. We can't even hold our lover's hand in public without fear or second guessing. We live in fear every single day that today might be our last, not because of fate or nature or God's design, but because a cis had decided that his right to discriminate trumped my right to life. This was never about marriage or bathrooms or, or your religious liberties or even our basic human rights. This was always about fear, your fear of us, and our fear of you.